Going live. Dot, dot, dot. You're live. It says we're live. Alrighty. Hello there at home, Cordsman. Hopefully you're tuning in and ready to learn some new stuff. So tonight we're working on Dan's rusty old laptop and it could be that the live streaming is a little bit there's a little bit of buffering and maybe not be as high quality as before let us know Geordie's here and we can, maybe we can adjust some things if we need to but uh, thanks for tuning in thanks for being here on time everybody um, what we're going to talk about today is we're going to look at how to arrange music in the barbershop style so uh, tonight I've, I've picked a familiar song that harmonizes well for our purposes today My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean I'll be using the program Sibelius to arrange the song that's what you're seeing here, this is Sibelius I'm not going to talk much about how to use Sibelius because there are probably lots of tutorials on how to do that online but I am going to talk a lot about how to take a melody and some chord symbols and arrange it in the barbershop style. Uh, as with each of our virtual classes so far, if you have questions, please type them in the chat bar and we will try to answer them as we go. I've got Jordy here with me and he's going to be monitoring um, the questions and when he sees a relevant, pertinent question, he'll he'll wave me, wave to me and I'll He'll tell me what it is and I'll answer it as best as I can in the video. So before we start, um, uh, we want to, I want to briefly talk about what is barbershop harmony. I'll just open a word document. I've got this written out. Um, so what is barbershop harmony is pretty useful for us to know what that is before we jump in and try to arrange something in the barbershop style. Because we, a lot of us, if we're barbershop singers, we know what it sounds like, but we might be hard pressed to put it into words. So we're gonna, we're gonna read what uh, David Wright wrote on the subject of what is barbershop harmony, because he's thought about it a lot and he's arranged a lot of barbershop songs and just been barbershopping for a good many years judging barbershop and whatnot. Um, so, let me just find that word doc. Here we go. There it is. Now let's just scroll down, find it. Here we go. What is barbershop harmony? This definition comes from David Wright, who is a barbershop harmony society arranger and judge. And barbershop historian too, so he's studied a lot. So barbershop is consonant four-part harmony. It's a cappella. It has solid voicings. It has harmonic variety and a few passing tones. The melody is usually in the second tenor or the lead voice, as we call it. The first tenor is above the melody. That's the what we call just the tenor part. Bass is usually on solid chord tones, roots or fifths, and the baritone completes the chord, either above or below the second tenor. Embellishments continually converge to homophonic chords. Homophonic means when we're seeing the same word sounds at the same time. This means that we can use other musical devices such as solos and instrument imitation, but we always come back to a homophonic sound. In the barbershop style, there's also a lot of freedom with the song, including interpretation theatrically and musically. And this is kind of what barbershop's all about. The chords are tuned with an ear towards lock and ring. This means tuning in favour of the natural harmonic scale, also known as just intonation. Cool. So, um... What info do we need before we start arranging the parts? So we need to have the melody. So you can see here on Sibelius in front of me, I've got I've got everything set out on the barbershop stage with the tenor lead up there and the baritone bass down there. 
And I've got my melody written out in the treble clef, the sub octave treble clef. The lead's going to be singing the melody. I've also got chord symbols written above. So that's your F7, your B flat, your E flat, and so on. Um, another thing that helps a lot before we start is a typical, uh, sorry, a knowledge of the typical range of the parts. So I don't have that written out, I'm sorry, but um, I'll talk a little bit about it as we go. Um, so that's just knowing that the tenor is usually in this range, and the lead is in this range, and the bass is in this range, and the baritone is in this range. It can be flexible from arrangement to arrangement, but there's kind of a an average range or uh, tessitura for each of the parts, and I'll refer to that a little bit as we go. So now I'm going to start arranging the song as we see as we see it before us. Um, actually, what we're going to do is we're going to have a good listen to the melody in case you're unfamiliar with the melody. So that's the melody of My Body Lies Over the Ocean. Hopefully that's similar to what everybody knows of, of that song. Um, and so I'm going to start arranging the parts. And I usually do it in this order. This is the order I'm going to go do tonight. And this is the order I would normally do it when I'm doing an arrangement. Um, I'm assuming that the melody is already written out. And then the first, part I, the first harmony part I write is the bass. After we write the bass, I usually write the tenor part in, and then finally, I write the baritone part in. So I'm going to start with the, the bass. So we need to know a little bit about the bass and what its role is before we start plucking some notes on. So the bass is the foundation of the chord, and as such, is usually on one of two strong chord tones, the root note or the fifth. So, I check what the chord is, it's an F7 according to my sheet music here, I check what the chord is, it's an F7, and I check what chord tone the lead is on. If the chord is a major triad, for example this second chord is a major triad, B flat major, um, a major triad has only three unique notes, this one would have B flat, D and F. In fact, what I'm going to do is as I go, I'm going to, whoops, I'm going to notate what those chord, what those three notes are in each chord, and I'm going to put it up above the chord. Hopefully that's clear. Let's do something similar for this chord too. So in F we have. What do we have? Cool. Um, so, I was just talking about this major chord. So, uh, if we're harmonizing a major chord, which has only three unique notes, so B flat, D, and F, if it's a B flat major chord, um, I would almost always put the bass on the root note of that chord. Even if the lead is on the root note too, the bass can double the root note in a major triad. If I'm harmonizing a seventh chord, which I am on this first chord here, a seventh chord has four unique pitches. So an F7 has F, A, C, and E flat. Um, so the, in this instance, the lead is on the root note of that chord, which is F, which means that I only really have one choice for the bass, which is to put it on C. So I'm going to put it in there. That's the bass still in there. 
and are running the same rhythm as the lead. So if the lead's got a crotchet, the bass got a crotchet too, we want the parts to have the same rhythm together because it's homophonic. Um, so in this second chord here, where it's a B flat major triad, which has three unique notes, B flat, D, and F. I'm probably going to end up doubling the B flat, but the lead here's the D, which is the third. So I've structured it here, root, third, fifth. The obvious choice for the bass is to sing the root note, which is a B flat. I'm just going to fix something quickly, guys. I don't think. Cool. All right, so move on to the next chord here. So we're still this B flat chord is carrying across until we get to a change of chord there at E flat. Um, so we're still we're still making a B flat chord here. The lead appears to be on a C, which is a ninth in relation to the B flat chord. That's interesting. We're going to come back to this a little bit later on. But the bass's choice is still obvious, the bass is still mm. going to be a B flat down there. And then, still going to be mm. in a B flat for this chord here. So now we get a change. Now we we'd get a change of chord to E flat major. The, the notes in E flat major are, let me just write them here for you. E flat is the root, G is the third, and B flat is the fifth. You can look up what uh, how to spell different chords. So if you just say, look up what is in an E-flat major chord on Google, it'll tell you straight away what those are. Um, so again, looks like the lead is on a C. The C's not in this chord. That's a bit odd lead. What are you doing? That's just what the melody's doing. We'll come back to that a little bit later. He's sort of forcing this chord to be an E-flat 6 chord. I'm going to write an E-flat 6 there. Still, though, the bass needs to be on the root note of this chord. And he's going to stay on that root note throughout that bar. Next, we come to another B flat chord. In this instance, the lead is on F. I'll just copy this over here. So the lead's on the fifth, which is the F. The, which means the, the root note is free for the mm -hmm. bass. Good. Then the lead moves down from an F down to the D, mm -hmm. which is the third of the chord. So the bass is still free to stay mm -hmm. on the B flat. And put a tie mm -hmm. just to match the rhythm of the lead. What we're going to do is have a little listen to what we've got so far. So we've got a lead and bass duet. Let's see if it sounds any good. I'm just going to slow the tempo down so we can hear it a little bit longer. Let's listen one more time. Now to my ears that sounds very consonant. So as David Wright said before, the barbershop sound is a very consonant sound which is what we've got. In fact, in most songs, if you duet the lead and the bass, you're going to have a very solid sounding duet, assuming everybody sings in tune. It's going to be very solid sounding, lots of consonant intervals. Um, so now we get to another F7 chord. This is pretty much identical to what happened at the start. At the start, so mm. bit. it's an F7 chord. The lead is on an F, which is the root note which means the bass has to sing the fifth, so the bass is just going to sing a C again there. Cool. And let's move on to the next line. It sort of starts the same as it did before, so the lead is going Bonnie lies, just as it did in that bar. So I could probably just copy paste the bass to there. Something different happens here. So the lead's doing the same, oh no, the lead's doing something slightly different here. So instead of going, Bonnie lies over the, the lead goes, Bonnie lies over the, different melody. Yeah, question there. 
Yeah, Dan, you've used the word consonant a lot. Can you tell us what you mean by that? Consonant. Okay, so certain intervals are consonant and certain intervals are dissonant. Um, without going into too much detail right now, there is a thing called the harmonic series. Um, I'm just going to draw you a little thing here. So low on the harmonic series we have an octave. Basically the lower on the harmonic series, if you want to do a quick Google on the harmonic series or overtone series, you'll find this. The lower the interval is on the harmonic series, the more consonant it is. So an octave is very consonant, that's low on the harmonic series. The next one would be a fifth, Oops, uh, that interval there, that's a fifth. Then um, a fourth, that's a fourth. And then you've got a major third. And then we start getting smaller and smaller, so minor thirds, uh, minor third, like that. Then a major second, then a minor second. And then, yeah, it just gets smaller and smaller, and it gets so small that we don't really use it at all. Um, but, so, consonant harmony is based on things like fifths, fourths, and octaves, and major thirds. Now, a little bit of dissonance makes good music, so that's why we have lots of minor thirds in there. Like when we have our barbershop seventh, that's a, got a minor third between the fifth and the seventh of the chord. We like, we enjoy that sound. That's, that's satisfying to the ear, especially when it resolves. Um, hopefully that answers your question. We can talk about consonants and dissonance a lot. But basically your consonant intervals are octaves, fifths, fourths, thirds, and then it starts to get more dissonant after that. So, um, good question. Thank you. Who, who asked that question? Roger. Roger, of course. <laughs> Good on you, Raj. All right, so we got a C7 chord here. Now, ooh, I better spell out the C7 chord. Nope, not about doing that. Copy this. So a C7 chord goes C, E, G, and then B flat. That's a C7 chord. Um, so, in this is, is interesting. The lead, the melody is on the B flat, which is the seventh. That's cool. That means my bass, he could sit on either the C, which is the root note, or G, which is the fifth. Um, of the two, the root note is usually the more stable and consonant one to use, so I'm going to use the root note. And I'm just going to have the bass sing three Cs straight across there. Something interesting is happening here, where the lead is on an A, which is a sixth, which is going to force the chord to change briefly to a C6, so I'll just write that in there. And then it'll change back to a C7 when we get to that chord there. F7, we've seen an F7 before, haven't we? Let's just copy paste that. So in this case, we, we need an F7 chord here on the word C. The lead has the, has the C, has the note C, I should say. And the bass is, the clear choice for the bass is to sing the root note, which is F. So let's give the bass the root note, and we'll make it match the rhythm, and tie it over like that. Okay. Now, we're still on an F7 chord, according to the sheet music here, so this is still going to be F7. I might just copy, paste that over there. And this is kind of identical to what happened at the beginning of the song again. So the lead is on the word my, is on F on my, the bass is going to be on a C, which is the fifth. That's the root note, that's the fifth. Moving on. I think we've seen something similar like this in the first line. So let's have a listen to that. It sounds like it's the same as the first line, so I might just do a quick copy paste of the bass part. This is great in Sibelius, you can just copy and paste stuff, you don't have to write it all out again. 
So we might just have a quick listen now to our lead bass duet as it is, as it stands. So back to the beginning. Do, do, do. Have a listen to this bass lead duet. It should sound pretty consonant. Lots of thirds, fifths, fourths, and maybe some octaves in there. Sixths too in the series. Here it is. <laughs> Fifth there. So to me it sounds pretty consonant, pretty harmonious, pretty pleasing to the ear. It sounds like the skeleton of a barbershop arrangement. Um, what happens here? So we're at a B flat chord. I might just copy and paste our B flat notes down to here. So, and I'll copy paste that as well. So we, the lead is on an F. The F is the fifth of the B flat chord, which means the logical choice for the bass is to be on the root note. So, fifth root note. And then let's have a look at what happens in this last line here. So, looks like our, we're going to be hitting an E flat chord across here. I'm just going to get the bass to go E flat, E flat, E flat, because that's the root note of that chord every time. Looks like the sneaky old lead is going to be making a, this into an E flat 6 chord here, you sneaky bugger. So, that's briefly an E flat 6, that's a little passing, passing tone. Then we have F7, our F7 notes are, let's copy paste, copy, paste. Our F7 notes are F, A, C and E flat. The lead is on A here, that's the third of the chord, that hasn't happened yet on the F7 chord. So we're going to give the bass the F, which is the root note. In fact, let's get the bass to go F, F, F straight across here. Hear that dissonance there? It's just, a, it's, we call that a rub sometimes. I'm probably going to have to change that later on. But just leave that there for a second. This chord would probably be called an F9. With no, well, it's going to be some kind of F9 chord. We'll come back to that soon. Then it goes back to F7 here. And then we're going to return home to our tonic chord, which is B flat. And so let's put the bass down on the low B flat there. Cool. So I've pretty much written out the bass part. It's going to change a little bit, I know, because, well, because of that one there. That's interesting on Bonnie. But we've got it, most of the bass part pretty close to how I think it's going to end up. So let's listen to it from the start. That lovely fifth there. dissonance there between the E and uh, with the, between the G and the F. Let's listen to it one more time and take it from here. Just there for a second there's this dissonance which is not altogether unpleasing or anything like that but I just want to flag it because we rarely have the lead and the bass only a tone apart only in rare situations so probably going to have to alter that. But, back to the top, because what we're going to do now is write in the tenor part. So, 
we I aim to put the tenor part on a chord tone above the lead and I try to keep it within the tenor tessitura so that's the tenor's um, sort of average range where it spends most of the time in an arrangement so if we put the tenor on really high C's the whole time the tenors wouldn't be too happy with that but one or two in, in a song maybe at the end is, is fine um, when writing the tenor part I am looking for smooth voice leading i.e. moving the tenor part by semitones or tones whenever possible smooth voice leading is probably most important in writing the tenor part because if the tenor part jumps around too much it sounds clunky or jagged now I need to just do something quickly in Sibelius which is highlight all of the lead notes and put them into the second voice by going alt 2 and that makes all the lead notes stems go down. Do you see that? And I've got some rests here which are just ready and waiting for, to be filled with tenor notes. We have a question. Yeah, um, so we've got two questions two. which might, um, you might be able to answer at the same time. So Rog asks, um, what is the significance of determining the sixth chord on the word back? Didn't it affect the selection of the bass note? Um, and adding that, uh, Peter Thomas has asked, what's the meaning of 6, 7, or 9 on the chord? Okay, good questions. Um, so, I'll probably answer Peter's question first. So, uh, let me just maybe make a new bar over here where I can draw some stuff. Oh no, what's going on? Okay, here we go. So let's say we've got. I'm going to use C chord. So a C major chord. I need to make that into any natural. A C major chord is a triad that has root, third, and fifth. And it to um, when you spell the or when you uh, name the chord, you would just write C. If the C was flat, if the if sorry if the E, which is the third of the chord, is flat, it becomes a C minor, and you write C M like that. Um, let's make it back to a major chord for a second. When you see, uh, let's go C seven first. That means we add, we stack another third on top. So this that's G, that's the fifth, and then we stack another third on top, which is a B flat like that. And that is our very hunky dory barbershop sound. Yeah, that's that's seventh chord, it's got a bit of sass to it. So the seven, the C on its by itself refers to a major triad, and if you add a seven to the name of it, that's talking about adding a flat seven like that. If instead it was a sixth, that adds a major sixth to the to the chord. In the case of C, that's an A. So, one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's how it's. It's really it's the sixth note in the C major scale. That's where that's what the six means. So that's one, three, five, six. And if we moved it up, one, three, five, seven. That's a flat seven. So if you see a number like seven or nine, it's referring to you're adding an extra note um, that is from the scale, from the note, from the, the parent scale of the note. That's sort of simplifying it a little bit too much, but hopefully that sort of answers that. What was Roger's question again? Something about the. Uh, so Roger was asking about the significance of determining the sixth chord on the word back. Okay. Didn't affect the selection of the bass note? Question mark. Uh, yeah, good question, Rog. As always. Um, so I'll just move that out of the way. So the E flat six. I had to call it an E flat six because 
the lead is on a C, which is the sixth in relation to the root note, which is E flat. One, two, three, four, five, six. Um, now I can't change the melody, at least I don't want to, so I'm going to call it an E flat six chord. I want to keep it as an e, a kind of E flat chord because it's in amongst a bar of E flat chords, and the sheet music originally just said E flat for that whole bar. But this lead melody is going to force a chord change because he's on a non-chord tone. Now in a 6 chord, we want uh, the strongest way to voice a 6 chord is with the bass on the root note. So yes, even though he's a major chord there and he, the bass is on the E flat, he's going to stay on that root note and just do everybody a solid by <laughs> maintaining the the feel that this is some kind of E-flat chord even though the lead's mucking around and doing some crazy stuff up here um, hopefully that kind of answers that um, in barbershop there's only like I think a couple, two ways that we voice six chords and I think in both of them the bass stays on the root note yeah hopefully that answers your question Roger uh, if not we'll come back to it a little bit later on all right, so we're about to write in the tenor part. So the tenor part, I'll just quickly recap what I said before. The tenor part, uh, I'm looking for smooth voice leading as much as possible. So for, so I'm thinking about moving the tenor part only by semitones or tones. Um, the smooth voice leading is really important in writing the tenor part. If it jumps around too much, it makes everything sound clunky and jagged. Um, we try to put the tenor, as with all the parts, we try to put it on a chord tone that is above the lead. So for the first chord, F7, remember our chord tones are up here, F, A, C, and E flat. I see that the lead is on the root note, the mm -hmm. F, and the bass is on the fifth, mm -hmm. C. That leaves either the third, e, uh, A, or the seventh. E flat for the tenor to sing. It looks to me like the E flat, which is here, sits nicely in the tenor range. The A, if I drag it down to the A, it's getting a little bit low for the tenors. It's more of a baritone range note, so that's probably what the baritone's going to end up singing. So I'm going to put the tenor up here, the E flat. Pretty typical spot for a tenor to start, in fact, in the key of B flat is to start on an E flat. Uh, the next chord is a is a B flat major triad. There are three unique pitches in this triad, so B flat, D, and F. The root note, bar, is already being sung by the bass. The third is being sung by the lead. So I could give the tenor either the fifth, F, or double the root note because mm -hmm. in a major triad you can double the root note it looks to me if I chose if, let's say if I chose B flat it would be putting it under the lead my bone I don't think that's a particularly smooth voice leading for the tenor but if instead I go up to the the fifth F my bone my bone that's a nice smooth voice leading for the tenor. So I think that's probably where the tenor is going to go. Um, if we could, and the other, other option of course is put the tenor ah, way up on that B flat, my bar, which is a bit of a leap. So again, probably not. It even gets, see the note goes into a, a different color <laughs> when you go up too high because it's like warning, warning, warning. If you go up high enough, it starts to go red. We don't want to go that high. Not, not on day one. So here we go. Let's put the tenor on F, nice and comfy. Uh, so, oh yeah, and the other thing, interesting thing about this is this is exactly the same way that my Wild Irish Rose starts. Sound familiar? That's exactly the way Wild Irish Rose starts. Um, <laughs> if it sounds like a polecat, 
you're likely writing some good barbershop. <laughs> the polecats are really good to study if you want to learn about arranging in the barbershop style. Okay. So in this next chord, ah, the lead is on a C, which is really, it's a ninth against a B flat major, B flat major chord. So I'm going to write in a chord symbol here. I'm going to write B flat, add nine. So when you have a major triad and you add the ninth in, that's how you notate that chord, or that's how you name it. B flat, add nine. And in a B flat, add nine chord, I better quickly spell out the notes here. Copy, paste. We have B flat, then D, then F, and we also have the ninth, which is C. So, our tenor, well, there's four notes, so the tenor, uh, that means there's no doubling in a, in a four-note chord. You can double when you've got a, a triad, a three-note chord, but there's no doubling when you have a four-note chord because we've got four voices. So, the, the root note is taken, and the ninth is taken. So, the tenor has to be either F, of the fifth, or D, the third. Looks like the tenor's already on the fifth. So for smooth voice leading, I'm going to keep him there. Um, so seeing how, yeah, the tenor's already on the fifth, let's leave him there. So sometimes smooth voice leading means not moving voices from the note they're already on. So if you can stay on the same note, then that's a good way to voice lead. And I think we could probably do the exactly the same thing on this chord too. This is another B flat chord. We've got the root note. We've got another root note. And the fifth. I think we can guess that the baritone is probably probably gonna have the third in this chord when we write the baritone in. Okay, next bar. So here we get our first six chord. Um, oh, so we need to you know, naming of this chord, we need to put the sixth in, which is a C. Um, so, here's the thing. And when you have a sixth chord, you can... There's two ways you can write... There's two ways you can spell a sixth chord. I better write them both here. So, one way is you have the root, the third, the fifth, and the sixth. Another way is that you omit the fifth, crazy I know, and you double the root. So I'll put another root up the top like that. So you can have, and where's the mm -hmm. mm, root note third, fifth, sixth, or root note third, sixth, sixth, root note. So you could double the root note. And I think I'm actually gonna use this option here. So, I'm going to put the tenor on E flat, which is the root note, doubling the bass. The lead is there on the sixth, and the baritone is going to, he's going to have to take the third when we get to his, his turn. So I'm going to delete that one, and when I come back to it, this is how we're going to spell that chord. Here we've got, oh, maybe I shouldn't have deleted that. Here we've got... A typical E flat chord, which is a triad. So it had, oh, that needs to be a B flat. So you've got a root note third, fifth, bum, bum, bum. Looks like the lead is on the fifth and the bass is on the root note. And because it's a triad with only three notes, I can double others, double the root. I'm going to double the root with the tenor part. I put the tenor there again. So again, pretty smooth voice leading. The tenor's not moving from his from his post. Um, then we get this is another E flat chord. I'm just going to name these chords correctly. So this is another E flat chord here. We've got a root note. We've got a third. We're gonna need a fifth in there somewhere. 
And we're probably going to double the root note again. So that's the tenor's job, doubling the root note. The tenor often sings octaves with the bass. So the tenor's up there and the bass is down there. That happens very frequently in barbershop music. Okay, um, we better move on a little bit quicker. So here, B flat chord, triad. We've got the fifth. Oh, sorry, we've got the root, the fifth. I'm going to put the tenor on the third. So that's, we've completed the triad there, and then the baritone will probably have to double the root note. This is still a B-flat chord, so let's just copy... Oh, yeah, that'll do. Um, so we've got root note third. Hmm, that means the tenor can either come down and double the root note, or I can take him up to the fifth, to the fifth again, where he's been before. This is a bit of a quandary, so which one do we do? It's an equal distance for voice leaning. From the third down to the root is a third, a jump of a third, I should say. And from the third to the fifth, that's another third. So it's pretty much equal voice leading. Um, the only thing that would, I'm gonna, I'm gonna choose the upper note, which is an F. The reason for that is because I've, I know where the baritone's gonna go. He's gonna go, he's gonna double the root note. And I've seen this chord before. Uh, voice like, I'll put the baritone in there now. Oh, baritone's gonna go there. Tenor's gonna go there. I'll let you hear this chord. So, um... The bass is the bass is still on the root. The good old dependable bass down here. Uh, I've elected to put the tenor up on the fifth. Um, either way, it's going to be not particularly smooth voice leading because we're jumping a third, but still not bad. Um, so if I if they put the tenor down on the on the root, then I'd have to put the baritone down here on the fifth. Let's hear that chord. It's consonant, uh, but it's kind of low. And if you start to get too low, you start to get muddy. Especially when everybody's too close together and low, it starts to sound a bit muddy. We space it out a little bit more and put the tenor back up here. Then. That's a pretty commonly used chord, especially when the lead goes down to the th a low third like that. Um, um, so I prefer this way, and, and from memory I have seen this chord voicing in other arrangements. Uh, let me call you sweetheart springs to mind. Let me call you sweetheart. It starts on that chord. If we go hear it again. Let me call you sweetheart. That's how that's, that one starts. Alright, uh, let's move on. So. This chord, I think we can do a bit of a copy paste from. Look, it's the same as the first chord. So I'm gonna use the put the tenor. Oops, why does it do that? I put the tenor on the third, on the seventh, I should say. As we go and write the tenor part in, you can start to see that the baritone is gonna get whatever chord tone is not being sung. So if the root note is taken, the fifth is taken, the seventh is taken. Mm -hmm. The third is going to be where the baritone's going to go. We'll write that in later, but that's definitely where he's going to go. Okay, bar five. So, I think we can kind of double what we did in bar one here. So, it looks like Leeds doing the same thing. Bar, knee lies. And we're going to get the tenor to do the same thing. Here we get some interesting stuff. Okay, look. So we got a chord that we haven't seen yet for the tenor to sink his teeth into. And so before, it went to an E flat chord. This time it goes to a C7 chord. It's gonna sound quite different. You can hear it in the bass. 
Let's just have a quick listen to what's going on so far. Actually, guys, let's listen to what we got from the very start and see what the, the trio sounds like. Tenor, lead, and bass together. Pretty cool, right? That first line, I think it sounds alright. Let's listen one more time. I think it's sounding pretty good. There's moments in this first line though where you're like, oh, it's just, there's something missing. That, of course, is the baritone. The baritone's missing. He's going to complete the chord. We'll get to that later. Now, something really interesting happens here. This is where we start to get some really nice bar barbershop happening. Because um, we get this juicy chord. So we're in the key of B flat. So B flat is home. It's chord one. When we get to a C chord, that's chord two, which is usually a minor chord. But we've got a C7, so it has a major third in it. That's the E natural there. Um, so it looks like an E natural would be a pretty good fit for the tenor because the tenor's either got to go down by a semitone to E. So he's on F. It's got to go down by a semitone to E or up a full tone to G. And it looks like it's slightly smoother if I, if I sing an E natural. And that's a really nice note for the tenor to have. That's an accidental note. You remember we talked about that in the music theory course. So it's a note from outside the key that adds some tension or some... I like to think of it as spice. Add some spice. And the tenor is just going to... He's going to smash that E natural all the way across there. The lead, he's doing some... Over the... He's doing some fancy stuff. He's going from the 7 to the 6 to the 7. The tenor is just going to hang on the 3rd. And the bass is going to hang on the root note. So the lead's kind of doing, he's doing the moving and shaking in this bar. But the, everybody else is really importantly carrying out the chord tones. Now, I'm just, while I'm here, let's write out what the C6 chord is. Remember there's two different ways to write a C6 chord. You can double the root, or you can have four individual tones. I'll just write it like that for now. I'll come back to this. And copy that over here while I'm here. Um, so now we get to an F7 chord. The bass is on the root note. The lead is on the fifth. And so let's look at the voice leading options. The tenor is on an E natural. He could go to A, which is a bit of a leap up or down. Or he could go from E flat, uh, E natural to E flat, which is probably the very barbershoppy thing to do. So let's put him there. Let's have a listen to this much. Oh, listen to that gorgeous voice leading in the tenor. Let's listen to that one more time. Notice that the tenor moves by semitones across this across these four bars here. It's just a beautiful bar shop. Have a listen. Beautiful, isn't it? No. Oh, yeah. Moving on. Now we've seen this chord before. It's another my chord, <laughs> just like in my wild Irish rose. And we're going to use the same. We're going to put the ten and ten on the seventh for that chord. Okay. Last, we're getting into the third third line here. Yeah? Okay, we've seen this before as well. So we're going to get the tenor to do the same thing as before and go straight across. Bonnie lies, and I think we've seen this before as well. I think that was in bar two. Yes, so we're just going to get the tenor to go three E flats in a row. Same thing happened here. Ocean. 
so we'll keep that the same. Um, so, bring back my Bonnie to me. Okay, so, it's a B flat triad, so there's B, D, and F. B is taken, mm -hmm. F is taken, and I could put the tenor, you could double the root note. Oops, probably not way up there. You could double the root, double the root note, or it could be on the third. I think the third's probably in the more tenory kind of range. So let's put him on the third. And now we hit the home stretch for the tenor. So we've got an E flat chord. What's in our E flat chord? It's a triad, so there's only three different notes. Let's do that. We've got In our E flat chord, we have E flat, G, and B flat. E flat is taken, G is taken. We could put the tenor on B flat, but that's kind of low for the tenor. Look how low that is. I think that's more like tenor land. We'll put him there. We've got an E flat 6 chord. Ooh. There's a couple of different options for E flat 6. Let's have a look at earlier. I think we're probably going to use that option, so I'll just paste those chord tones down here. So, double the root. You can double the root in a 6 chord and leave out the 5th, so... Put the tenor on the root note, which is E-flat. That's another standard E-flat chord, E-flat triad. And tenor's going to stay on the E-flat. Doubling the root note with the bass. Ooh, okay, there's some fancy stuff that's going to happen in a second. So, this is an F7 chord. We've got the root note, which is F, the third in the lead. We need a fifth, and we need a seventh, fifth and a seventh. If I put the tenor on the seventh, look at that smooth voice leading. He doesn't have to move at all, he just stays. This happens a lot in the tenor part. The chords change, but the tenor can hit the same note. Baritone does something similar too. In fact, let's do that three times in a row for the tenor. So in an F9 chord, I better just spell that one out. So a full F9 chord has five notes. Obviously we can't do that in Barbershop. Um, we need to have... We can only have four different unique notes. Um, so you've got to leave out one of them. When you're writing a ninth chord, you've either got to leave out the fifth, which is C, or, this is odd, leave out the root note. That happens sometimes when um, the melody goes from, so what's the rhythm? If the melody goes from 9, which is a G, to 1, which is F, 9, 1. That's not really happening here. The melody's going back up. So we're probably not going to use that. We'll come back to this in a second. This is a bit of a weak chord. We might need to choose a substitute chord to go in here. I think that's what we're going to need to do. And then we hit our final chord over here. So this is a B flat, B flat triad. A B flat triad has F and D and B flat. We've got the root note and the root note. So we got we got either the third or the fifth. I think we can put the tenor on the third because look at that nice voice leading from E flat to D. Okay, so we've written in the whole tenor part. We're like three quarters done here, people. Let's listen to the whole arrangement now. Sorry about it, I'm going to delete these notes because I want to hear the trio tenor, lead, bass with no baritone. We've got pretty much a whole arrangement here except that the baritone is left out. Now we're going to we're going to hear <coughs> what <laughs> the how important the baritone is because you're going to notice that he's not there. Here we go.
I reckon that's sounding pretty good. So it sounds pretty smooth. We cho we, we've got a lot of good smooth voice leading for the tenor part, which is so important for making the arrangement sound smooth. Um, the bass and tenor, the bass and lead are doing their thing, but it needs the baritone. You can really notice that the baritone is missing. Some of these chords sound really empty, especially when you on this one here, for example, when you're missing a third. Listen to this chord. Kind of a nice chord, but definitely em kind of empty feeling. We have a question. Yeah, Dan. Uh, so right at the end there, there's an F9, um, and some of us aren't clear on why F9 has five notes, um, but the E flat still remained as part of your choice. Okay. Um, so yeah, when you see F9 on a piece of sheet music, it mean it it it, it means a five note chord. So you've got a root note, third, fifth, flat, seventh, and a ninth. Um, so if I'm reading a piece of piano sheet music and it says F9, I'm going to play all those five notes. Now, you can imply a, a 9 even with four notes. So if you take out the fifth, then you have a, a root note, a third, a seventh, and a ninth. It still sounds like a, it has the, the, the taste of a ninth, can we say. The other way you can do it is you can leave out the root note and have the ninth, and usually the ninth in it is a suspension that falls down and becomes the root note. Um, so, why keep in the E flat? So there is another kind of chord, so if we, I'll write it over here. If you wanted, say, a four note chord like this, which is an F triad, F major triad, plus the ninth, quite a pretty sounding chord, then you'd write F add 9. So it means it's an F triad plus one extra note, which is the ninth. But that's different to an F9. When you write F9, you're implying five notes. Whereas this is a four note, four unique notes in this chord. We saw another kind of nine chord earlier. Do, 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 do. B flat add 9, which has a root note, a third, a fifth, and a ninth. So it has no seventh to speak of. Um, it's a bit weird the way it's written, I know. Sometimes people write B flat add two, that's another way of doing it. Or B flat add nine. I'm used to it now, but yeah, I can see that it's a little bit um, unintuitive. But when you see F9, that really means a five note chord. And if you're going to drop any of them, the fifth is probably the one you're going to leave out. Because the fifth, you don't miss it as much. It's not one of the flavorful notes in that chord. The flavorful notes are the third, the seventh, and the ninth. And the root notes are kind of just there to, to name it. Hopefully that answers that question. <laughs> is that Ro Roger's question, or Peter? Or? It's Roger's. Roger, of course. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna get rid of this chord now. What are you doing there? Bugger off. Get rid of that bar. Okay. So, you heard that we've got a trio, lead tenor and bass. There's no baritone yet, it didn't sound. Let's just listen to that first line again. It's nice, there's, there's good harmonies there, but definitely something missing, it's not barbershop yet. It's missing the secret ingredient. So, as David Wright mentions, the baritone completes the chord, either above or below the lead. This means the baritone has to sing what whichever chord tone is left. Baritone is sometimes called the garbage part for this reason. It gets the leftovers. But, despite being called by some the least prestigious part, the baritone is essential to barbershop harmony. As we just heard, without the baritone, the chords sound empty. So, as Theo Hicks once said, filling in the baritone part is a bit like doing a Sudoku. You look at what the chord of the moment is, then look at what chord tones are being sung, 
Then assign the baritone the remaining note. But in this part of the process, we may revoice some chords, swap notes around, maybe even find some unexpected but juicy chords hidden in the song. Smooth voice leading is important, but when it comes to the pecking order, baritone is the last considered for smooth voice leading. Hence, many baritone parts sound illogical or unintuitive. The first chord we look at is an F7. We see that the lead is on the root note, the bass is on the fifth, and the tenor is on the seventh. That leaves just the third for the baritone. Oh, and I need two. Let's make some room for the baritone first by making all of the bass notes into second voice notes. Now we have some rests where the baritone can sit in there. Now the baritone, that's too low for the baritone. Look at that, it's below the bass. We jump up an octave. There's the third. So now let's listen to that first chord. That's a barber choppy sounding chord. Listen to that. That's a good solid starting chord. That's like the beginning of Wild Irish Rose or lots of other tunes. Coney Island Baby. <laughs> um, so the next chord is a B flat major. The bass has the root. Uh, the lead is on the, so bass is on the root note. Lead is on the third, tenor's on the fifth. Which, because we're in a triad here, all the notes are taken, but we can double the root note. So that's what the baritone's going to do. He's going to sing the root note, an octave above the bass. All right, let's have a look at this B flat add nine chord. So the bass is still on the root. The lead is on the ninth. Duh. The tenor's on the fifth. That means we've got the third left for the baritone, which is D. So, the ten we could put the baritone there. Or way down there. That's a bit of a leap down, so it's going to be a leap up instead, which is much shorter. And it looks like in the next chord here, it's a B flat triad. We have the root note. We have another root note. And we've got a fifth. So baritone's going to stay on that third. Okay. Now we have an E flat six chord. So in this, we've decided we're going to have root note, third, six, root note. So we've got the root note, six, root note again. Baritone has to be on the third, which is a G. Whoa, that's a bit of a high G. Let's drop it down to there. That's more comfy. Now Troy's happy. And then we... Looks like the same thing's happening in this chord. So, here, you can hear... I'll play it for you. Hear that? The three of the notes stay the same. Bass goes straight across. Baritone goes straight across. Tenor goes straight across, but the lead's going over. So, in this instance, it's an E flat six that quickly resolves, if you will, to an E flat. So the lead is on the sixth, but it resolves down when it becomes a fifth. Um, so that's when you most often get this kind of sixth chord, which is the root doubled, um, as opposed to the other kind of sixth chord, which has four unique notes. This one has the root note doubled. Um, okay, now I've got another E flat major triad. So we've got a root note, we've got a third, we've got another root note. The baritone has to take the, take the fifth here, which is in a comfortable baritone range, handily. Um, okay, so now we're at a B flat triad. Um, looks like the root note's there, the fifth is there, the third is there. Um, so all the notes are taken, but we can double the root note in a major triad. There it is. What happens here? Root note, third, fifth. Again, all the notes are taken, but let's double the, the root note. Uh, 
Okay, that's our first line. Let's have a listen to complete four-part harmony. Oh, I don't know about you guys, but just when you fill in that baritone part, it just that's where the magic happens. When you f get the, the four-part harmony ringing all together. Here it is again. Oh, I love that. I think it sounds nice and solid. Okay, let's move on. So, as you can see, Theo Hicks is right. It's like a Sudoku puzzle. We just look at what the other parts are doing. What hasn't been sung, give that note to the baritone. So we got root note, fifth, seventh, baritone's on the third. Oh. That's the same chord as the beginning. I think something similar is going to happen here. So Bonnie lies, that's going to be the same as up there. So let's go. Bonnie lies. That's the same as in um, bar one, bar five. All right, something different is happening here. This is like my favorite chord. Oh. So C7 chord has C, E, G, and B flat. We've got a C, that's the root note. We've got the third, we've got the seventh. Baritone has to take the fifth. Whoa, not that high. Let's bring him down there. Cool. Now we have a C6 chord. Okay, this is a six chord where I think we do want to have four unique notes, C, E, G, and A. We've got the C, we've got the E, we've got the A, we don't have the fifth, which is G. So let's put him on the G. And look at that. That's two notes in a row of the same. That's nice voice leading. This is another C7 chord, so we can do the same thing as here. Let's put him on the G again. All right, F7 chord. Ooh, so what have we got? Let's listen to that chord. So when I hear a chord like this, I could just I hum and fill the, fill the note in. Da, needs to have a third in there. Mm. If you've ever been woodshedding, um, sometimes the other three guys have found three notes and you have to find the last one remaining. It's a bit like that. The, bar the baritone part usually is the last one. <laughs> and you have to have the ears to find it. Um, so yeah, that's a nice, that's a really nice solid F7 chord like you would hear in Shine On Me. Let's listen to that again. Oh, it's just a nice voicing where it's stacked up like a snowman. F A C E flat. It's a lovely chord to sing the lead and the bass have got a really rocking fifth there. That's oh, great. Okay. This is our favourite chord again. The baritones has the third. Let's put him on the third. How does it do that? That's okay. Okay. Uh, okay, this line I think is going to be exactly the same as the first line. Oh, the, the yeah, the first line. That's right, yeah. Let's do it the same as the first line. Here we go, Bonnie lies. Ooh, too high. Over the ocean. Let's just have a quick listen, make sure that it makes sense. Go from there. Yep, sounding good. All right, the word so, so this is a B flat triad. We've got the root node and the fifth and the third. So we're gonna just double the root node again. There it is. Cool, last line, home stretch. Here we go, baritone, take it home. All right, so E flat chord. It's a triad, three notes. Three unique notes. Root note, third, root note. Let's put the oh, on the fifth there, Baritone. That's a nice comfy note for you. Hmm. E flat six chord. 
I look at what the lead does because the lead goes from six down to five. So I'm probably going to use this kind of voicing where the root note is doubled and there's no fifth. Because it's almost like the six replaces the five and then becomes the five. It's a suspension. So put the baritone on the third. And it's on the third again there. Alright, now we're going to hit this patch and see what happens here. Alright, so this is a standard F7 chord. We've got a root note and a third and a seventh. So we'll put him on the on the fifth, that's the we'll complete the chord by just filling in that gap. Now I've got an F9 chord. Ooh. So remember there's two ways we can do an F9 chord. You can omit the fifth, which is C, or you can omit the root, which is F. Or we might need to choose a different chord altogether. Uh, so what have we got? We've got a root note, a nine, and a seventh. Let's try putting in on the third. Hmm. On this chord, it'll be quite obviously back to that note, because that chord and that chord are identical. Let's see, let's see how this plays. I'll go from there. I'm hearing a bit of a crunch here. Like a traffic jam. Let's have a listen again. Hmm, one more time. I think we can avoid this crunch here. So we've got two tones in a row. So F, G, A. That's very very closely voiced there. So, too close, I would say. In fact, it doesn't show here, but the lead is squashed between the barry, uh, the, lead, the bass and the baritone. The lead is actually in between those two notes. So it's kind of like that. That's not healthy. You can just go see the doctor if that happens. Um, so we're going to change it. <laughs> we're going to... Um, what I'm going to try here is, so the, I'm going to change the melody. And I'd like to leave the tenor doing that smooth voice leading across. But maybe the Barry and bass could do something different here. So I know that, delete this, a, a good substitute chord, when you're trying to do an F7 and you need a substitute for it, a nice chord to do is a C minus 7. So C minus 7 is spelled like this. C, E flat, G, and B flat. So minus sevens um, are less common than sevens in barbershop chords, in barbershop arrangements, but still we use them all the time because they're very, very useful chords. Um, so let's see if we can make this into a C7. That's the fifth. I want to keep the lead and the tenor the same. So that's the fifth. And that's the third. So the inner notes. We need a C and a B flat. So maybe I'm going to put the baritone on the B flat. So then he goes. Da, da, da. That's pretty smooth. Now the bass, I didn't say this before, but the bass can jump around. He, Of all the parts, he probably does the most jumping. So I'm going to bring him down to a C. Oh, that one there. So now I've got a pretty nice C minus 7 chord here. I think it's going to flow well, especially because we managed to keep that tenor voice leading the same. I'll go from here. I think that works pretty smoothly. Let's listen again. I'm going to leave that. I'm pretty happy with that. It's smooth for all the parts. The bass is a little bit of a leap, but that's pretty regular for a bass to do that. And of course we need to... Baritone has one last chord here to do. We've got a root note. We put another root note. We put the third. We need the fifth, so Baritone's going to... It's going to hit a home run. And lock in that fifth on the last chord there. Let's listen to that last line. I'll go from back from here. Uh, 
Okay. I reckon we might have it in the bag, guys. Let's go back to the very beginning. Let's zoom out and look at our score. It's a bit messy because we've got all those notes written all over it, but let's go back to the beginning. And we're going to play the whole song. I'll zoom in so you can watch it properly. Here we go. Cool. I'm pretty happy with how that sounded, guys. Let me just fix that little rest there. What are you doing? Um, so then I would sort of just do a little bit of a clean up and start deleting these things that I don't really need anymore. Um, so, um, I think geordie has got a question for me, sir. What's the question? Yeah, so I've um, got two questions here so far. Uh, first question is, um, how long would it take to arrange, say, a 58 bar song like Edelweiss uh, in the barbershop style. A weekend, a week, five to six hours? <laughs> How long would it take to arrange Edelweiss or something that's about that length, about 58 bars? Um, well, uh, it depends because if you just want to knock out a, a nice quick arrangement and don't want to do anything particularly fancy, you could do it in an hour or two, you know, if you know the rules and you sort of know what you're doing. Um, I imagine some people are really quick and could do it faster than that. If you're looking at creating, you know, a really nice showpiece, because in that, if, for example, in the arrangement of Edelweiss that we are learning, there's a key change in there. This is a really nice. There's a really nice tag. Um, so some of it is you is um, when you're doing arrangements, you take the melody and you take the chords and you just find the right notes for the voices. It's quite. You, like your your options are not vast. Um, it kind of it looks quite complicated, but once you know the rules, you're just really filling in the boxes, kind of like doing a Sudoku, like Theo Hicks says. You know, you're just solving a puzzle in a sense, and the places will form. There's logical choices for most things. Sometimes you get two choices that seem equally valid, like we did at points in this arrangement, and then you just choose the one that you prefer. But when, you know, you're writing a contest arrangement or a, or a really nice, Edelweiss is a really nice arrangement, um, and you want to do something creative with it, then you might do stuff like pass the melody to the bass or the tenor for, for a few bars, or write a key change, write a really nice tag, put a post in there. There's all these other kinds of stuff that we didn't touch on today, but you can use to spice up an arrangement. What we were doing today was pretty just your basics, taking a melody, writing four parts for it, harmonizing it in the barbershop style, as opposed to getting really creative and and, um, and writing something that's going to win the gold, you know. Hopefully that answers that question. Second question? Second question here, so um, when you're arranging, um, this is a question from Chris Drury, mm. uh, do you treat minor triads the same way as major triads? Um, so, minor triads, so minor triads, you, I would voice a little bit differently. Uh, I would always put the, or try to always put the bass on the root note of a major triad. Um, you need to be careful, so let me just zoom in for a second on this one. So what we've got here is, I'm calling this an E flat 6 chord. If I inverted it, and let's say it went C, E flat, G, that's really a C minor chord. So this E flat 6 chord has the same notes as a C minor chord. I'm calling it E flat 6 because the bass is on the E flat, so it's kind of, the bass has dominance over over the, the chord in, in a way. The I don't mean the bass personality, <laughs> I mean the bass function really 
kind of dictates how we hear everything that comes above it. Um, so that, uh, so, uh, but if it's a proper minor triad, which there aren't any of in this song, I would try and put the bass on the root note all the time. Sometimes, if the lead's on the root note as well, that's okay, you would double the root note. Maybe we can draw a little example for you down here. So let's say I've got a C minor chord. Uh, sure, let's put the, let's make that the melody. And that's the tenor. The bass is there. Baritone's there. And let's just make it a bit longer so we can hear it. So this is this is a C minor. Now, a minor chord is still very consonant. It's not as consonant as a major chord. Let's hear the major version. The major chord is very consonant and pleasing. The minor chord is slightly, sl slightly more dissonant, only a little bit. But with minor chords, you've got to be careful. Um, I would put the bass note, the bass on the root note. It depends on what the, le the lead's doing. If the lead's on the root note, you can double it. Um, I don't know what specific questions you've got, Chris, about minor chords. Um, but no, I don't treat them exactly the same as major chords. Um, they're a triad, and you would almost always put the bass on the root note. So, and uh, probably not, the th if you can help it, don't put the third too low in the chord. So for example, listen to it with the baritone on the third. That still sounds okay, it's perfectly tuned in Sibelius, but there's a danger of it coming too muddy, especially if it's voiced that way. So I would voice it as we did before with the, like that. And putting the tenor on the on the minor third. Like that. It's a little bit more consonant that way. Um, happy to answer specific questions later, Chris, if you want to email me. Um, but yeah, not sure, quite sure what, what, you, what you mean. Are there any other questions? Nope. Okay, cool. We're just going to listen to the song one more time then. Here we go. Oh, speed it up a little bit. Hey, we've been listening to it really slow. Let's, so here I change the tempo. Let's go up to about 100. Cool. All right, from the top. So folks, I don't think um, I don't think there's no anything more to add to that to my that's my arrangement of Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean. Um, I'll quickly run through um, how you arrange the voice parts in the order, just real quick. So I start with the melody written out and the chord symbols. <laughs> <coughs> oh dear, COVID. Oh well. Um, so I start with the melody written out. Um, and the chord symbols written above. And the first harmony part that I arrange is the bass. So the bass being the foundation of the chord. And as such, I put it on either the root note or the fifth. If it's a major triad and you can double the root note, so the bass can be on the root note pretty much all the time. If it's a, a four note chord, like an F7, you want to put the bass note on either the root note or the fifth. And if the melody is on the root note, like at the start here, the bass has got to go on the fifth. Then we do, the next part I write is the tenor. So um, I aim to put the tenor on a chord tone above the lead and I try to keep it within the tenor tessitura. So the tenor tessitura is fairly narrow. Um, bass has probably got the widest range in barbershop. 
Uh, when writing the tenor part, we're also looking for smooth voice leading. So if you just trace the tenor line, you can see that it doesn't move that much. It moves a tone here and there. Sometimes it jumps a third there, but mostly it's moving a tone or a semitone. Um, so if the if the tenor part jumps around too much, it sounds clunky or jagged. Uh, and then after we've written the, both the bass and the tenor, we're going to write in the baritone part. And it's like a Sudoku. Thank you, Theo Hicks. It's like a Sudoku. You look at what the other parts have done, and you look at what chord tone is left, and the baritone gets that. <laughs> uh, with some exceptions, you can revoice things or swap notes around. For the most part, if you've written a solid bass and tenor part, the, bar the baritone part writes itself. You just gotta cover what's left. So yeah, and then once you've done all that, you've got a pretty solid little barbershop arrangement there. I chose this song today because um, I know it harmonizes well, and I did a dummy arrangement or a demo arrangement of it just the other day. And I was like, yep, this works well. And it's got some nice barbershoppy chords in there, particularly this little C7. It's very nice there. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, thanks for tuning in. Hope you learned some stuff. Oh, we got one more question. Yeah, um, so just before we wrap up, this was really arranging 101. Um, if we were to do uh, an arranging 102, <laughs> what kind of things would we explore there? Okay, whose question is this? <laughs> Raj and Peter. <laughs> Raj and Peter. Okay, if we were going to do arranging 102, um, we might look at some of the other stuff that you see in Barbershop. Uh, like um, slides or swipes and some of the embellishments that we see in barbershop um, so slides and swipes uh, posts where you give one part one part a really long note and everybody else keeps on singing other stuff um, explore different voicings like putting stuff up high really spread out chords so um, sometimes at the end of a song like at the end of Coney Island Baby you'll see a chord like this where everyone's really spread out it's just a kind of glorious way to to end end a piece of music with this really big spread out sound you'll hear this chord and you'll know exactly what I mean it's kind of a triumphant kind of chord so that's like a big spread chord at the end um, some arrangers are exploring and working more with dissonance and working that into the style. Um, there's lots of cool stuff you can do with rhythm. Um, so pickups where the lead has a pickup and everybody else comes in a second later. Or there's bits where we kind of break out of um, homophony. Um, think of in Zippity Doodle when the lead is singing, Mr. Bluebird on my... And everybody else is going, this is just the kind of day that you dream about. So we've got the lead singing one thing, kind of like a lead solo, and everybody else is doing like backing vocals. That's another thing that's really fun to do in arrangements. Um, what other stuff? Jordy, you know lots about barbershop. <laughs> oh, there's heaps of stuff. But we have just one more question then, okay. so before we go. Sure. Um, so Stephen tried to find the Pitch Lab app um, that you mentioned in the first lesson. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm not able to find it. Um, is there an alternative that you might recommend? Um, so try TE Tuner. It... A tonal energy tuner for for you, all your tuning needs. Um, it it has different uh, way of displaying the visualizations and things like that, but it's still a very good and very popular tuning app. So I check out that one, tonal energy tuner or T E tuner. Lots of people use that one too. So cool. All right, I think we're gonna wrap things up there, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Um, I'll make my notes available and this video will be available to watch later on. I hope you got something out of this. I love doing arranging and it was fun to talk arranging, so I'll see you all.
next time I'm looking at you.